All right, we want to welcome in Jason Avant, of course, a former longtime Eagles receiver, always had sure hands, Mr. Third Down, and also he coached on the Eagles this year. We appreciate you joining us for some insight here, Jason. Oh, no problem, John. How you doing, buddy? Doing good. Good, uh, good. So, 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 like, beginning of last year, when you come on to coach with the Eagles, if I would have told you after this season that Doug Peterson would be let go – and Carson Wentz would be traded. I mean, would you have ever thought that this could shake out the way it did? Um, you never know what happens in the NFL, but no, you you would think that the the Doug's lease um, would be a little bit longer. So, um, and then Carson, and then there's reports of a lot of guys that are that are you know leaving as well. So, um, I definitely didn't think it would turn out like this. Um, but it's been a very bizarre off season. Um, I'm excited to see what the future holds, but you know, you're sad for those guys that, that, um, you know, have been relieved of their duties. So how about Jalen hurts when you saw him throughout the year coming in into kind of an awkward situation yeah. and tell us what he was like with the guys, his leadership, and maybe how he progressed as a player. Well, the one, th the one thing that you always know about um, that, that everyone should know is that um, Jalen is a worker um, he's a reps guy as far as, um, you know, he loves to be on the field, getting extra work. Um, and then he's confident the, that's the, and, and, and that right there, I believe is the, the good. Um, those are great signs for, you know, a quarterback. Um, you're putting in the work in the classroom and, all, and, all, and after practice, and then you're confident. He's the most confident guy in the room. So he doesn't believe that anyone's better than him. He believes that he's the best. And um, I love that about him. So, and, and you saw how much, um, you know, of a progression that he's made over those few games um, that, that he had. And a lot of people could, can look at his stats, you know, at the beginning when he first, you know, was named the starter. And then at the end, certain things happen when you are in his position, they're going to put more on you, more plays, more as you go along. And he didn't actually know the things that, that um, he was being asked to do. But when he was, the, 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 the tight game plan that he had, when he had a tight game plan and he knew exactly where to go, he played really well. So that's a good sign for the future. So here's a guy who's drafted in the second round. They had a starter in Carson Wentz. And then there's really no off season on the field. Yeah. And there's no preseason games. Uh, and Carson's getting pretty much all the snaps in practice. Yeah. Um, how much better do you think Jalen can be in a second year with a full off season? Um, he'll be better. Now it's, it's not, this is going to be his first year again, because when you change coaching staffs, you change everything. So everything that he learned, he learned, you know, the speed of the game. He learned, you know, what throws he can make, which throws he can't make in this league. Now, all of those things are valuable, but when it comes to learning an offense, this will be his first year in this offense. So doing this and getting rid of getting rid of a coaching staff just resets you. All the guys that came in this year, they, they have to be reset. Yes, there's little things that you're going to learn, but learning your offense, which makes you play faster, that right there is just a restart. Do I think he's going to be better? Yes, I think he's going to be better because, you know, he, he's gotten the timing down. He's, you know, all those things. But that hearing new terminology over and over again is never good for anybody on offense. Um, so it's a reset for the Eagles this year. And when you said that there were certain plays – that they were adding in and maybe he didn't know them as well. Uh, how difficult a process was that for all the coaches to try to keep it simple for him, but also try to put in some good plays? Um, you know what? It, it, all it, it all depends on the player and the coaches, right? So no matter how creative your plays are, you only can go as fast as the players, right? So you can come up with great schemes and they, and they could work. But you want you would rather to have a, a simple game plan where guys know what they can know what they're doing and they can play fast. That usually works out better. Um, when the Eagles went on their playoff run a year ago, there is also, um, you know, Jason Kelsey and other guys that said, you know, we just simplified our game plan and we started to play faster. When they went on a Super Bowl run with, with um, Nick Foles, because Nick Foles didn't start off playing, you know, the greatest. You know, he had some struggling, struggling games against, you know, Oakland and, you know, but when they – and Falcons in the playoffs. 
when they simplify the game plan, people start to play faster. And so um, I think that's no matter what you do, you want especially young players to simplify it so they can know it. And then you grow from there. And you only can go as far as um, as fast as a quarterback can retain that information. I think that he has the ability to retain everything. It's just that it's a complicated system. Coach Reed's West Coast offense is a very, very complicated system. There's a word for everything. I'll give you an example. Double wing right, zebra right, 200 jet, flank of job, zebra Texas, halfback burst on one-on-one. Ready? That's a play. And you have to re- be able to recite that to guys. You have to be able to know where you line, know when other, um, other um, players are lining up. And then you add three, four new receivers out there. and They don't know what to do. It just takes more time than what most people would think of. My head is spinning a little bit here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so the thing that I hear from guys about Jalen, some, some of you even said he seems like he's 40 years old as far as like, the mentality and leadership and calmness. Could you tell us about, uh, I mean, did he seem like a veteran at all instead of a rookie? He's a, he's very mature for his age. Very, very mature. He's not, he's a no, he's a no nonsense type of player. And I, and I think that has to do with, you know, his upbringing with his dad and, and um, you know, being, you know, um, you know, a wrestler, I mean, not a wrestler, but a, a power lifter and all of those um things that he has going for himself, being at Alabama, you know, being, you know, um, his job being taken. Like there's a lot of mature elements that that's transpired in Jalen's life to make him mature. But yes, he's definitely an old school and old soul. So um, and then he's very, very smart and um, very, very mature. So I, I think that he's he's going to be just fine. And the, the thing that you that you love about him is that he naturally um, wins the room. He has a he has a charisma that he can win the room very easily, and um, that's the one thing that you you, you notice right um, right away. How do you think Carson and Jalen handled that situation? Because it was awkward last year, and then it became even more awkward. You yeah. were there. How do you think they handled it? Um, I thought that they handled it the best way they could. It's hard. Like that situation is hard. It's it's like you know everyone. Everyone, you know, can tell you what you can do in that moment. We see it, you know, from, you know, a thousand foot view or we see it, you know, after the fact and we can come up with all types of scenarios. But if you or I were in a scenario and, and there's this young hotshot, you know, analyst or whoever, whoever else is coming in and they're giving them your reps and you starting to see the writing on the wall that you may not be here and they drafted this person to replace you. Those are things that you deal with and you have to learn how to channel that. I thought that Carson handled it the best way that he could. He never threw a teammate under the bus um, and he's a good teammate. There's a narrative that Carson isn't a good teammate. Carson is a a very good teammate. He's a very good person. So you wish him the best. Did he play the best? No, he didn't play. He hadn't played well this year. He played historically bad. Um, And guys have years like that. Can he rebound and overcome it? He can. Um, but, you know, he handled it the best way that he could. And I thought that Jalen did as well. The thing that I loved about Jalen doing this process is that Jalen never has a backup mentality. And some guys can be offended by that. You never know, because if the backup thinks that he's better than you, you know, that's OK, too. You know, you just have to have strong enough skin to to be able to deal in that moment as a coach. As, a, as an organization and as the starter, you have to be able to deal with it. And that's the one thing that I'll say about Jalen is that Jalen has always thought that he was the best quarterback in the room. And, and he has never said that. He's never come out and said that. But his disposition says that. And if that, make, if that made Carson uncomfortable, no one knows. So when you have two quarterbacks like that, I saw some of the younger guys, especially the, the rookies, kind of gravitating a little bit more to Jalen as the season went on. Do you think that was kind of an awkward situation? And do you think that is that Jalen's natural leadership that can lead these young guys into the future? Well, I, I pray that I pray that it happens that way because they have they have some talented guys. And I think that that it possibly, um, you know, I'm, I'm not let me say that I want to say possibly it definitely can. Um, was it awkward? Yeah, there's some awkward times, but there's awkward times in every, in every business, right? When when there's a shift that's happening, and it was a lot of shifts this past year, you know. So um, I'm sure that it could have been awkward for Carson or awkward awkward for you know the offensive coordinator or the head coach, but um, you 
you know, certain personality types gravitate toward other other personality types. And I thought that Jalen has a, a very, very robust, um, you know, um, just personality and people just gravitate to him. He's more charismatic. And that's just the truth. Were you disappointed or was it tough for you to see what happened with Doug and Carson and their relationship? No, certain things are behind closed doors. Like um, there's not many coaches that are, that'll be able to, to be able to discern or, or, or decipher that, um, you know, there is, there's the coaching and there was me underneath that because I was just new. And then there's the higher ups when you get, when you're dealing with Howie and Doug and, and Carson and all of those things, that was just a different level. We had an understanding um and, and we see the reports and, you know, as much as the coaches try to keep it straight, you see the reports and those. And whenever you start hearing multiple reports come out of the locker rooms and different things like that, and Mr. Lurie's disappointed and, and there is, you know, schisms or, you know, there is, you know, um, you know, disagreements. It's usually a bad sign because someone's putting those stories out there in order to, um, you know, um, change, change something in the future. Obviously, Deshaun Jackson was let go, and it's reported that Alshon Jeffrey is going to be let go. So right yeah. now, you're looking at a really young receiving core, and you know receivers really well. Were they able to show the best of what they have, like Jalen Rager, or is there a lot more there? No, it's a lot more there. So there's there's a lot more there. So like I said, like there we didn't play well as a team, right? The offensive line at times didn't play well. The receivers at times didn't play well. Um, on, on the offensive side of the ball, the quarterback definitely didn't play well, right, at times. So when you have that much inconsistency, it's hard to, to, to evaluate um, a secondary position. As much as the receivers have the, uh, uh, um, you know, the first mentality, like I'm the best player, every receiver thinks that they should get the ball every time and that they're the best thing since sliced bread. We're relying upon the offensive line, the running backs, the block, and the quarterback. So if those um, positions aren't doing their, their job or they're not doing it well, not executing well, you're not going to, to thrive. And that's just the truth. So, but there's talented guys. Quez is very talented. John is talented. Jalen is talented. And, um, and Travis is very talented. You have the veteran in, in Greg Ward. Um, so they have a talented group. Um, and I'm excited to see what they'll do with um, Jalen Hurts. I think that they're going to, you know, probably draft another receiver. Um, so we'll we'll see. I don't necessarily know if that's in the first round or not, but I, I definitely think that they're going to either going to draft the receiver or bring in a veteran, um, uh, you know, presence. And, and knowing Jalen and, and working around him and seeing the way he worked, there could be a situation. It, it's out there that the Eagles are keeping their options open. That. If they love a quarterback, they might draft a quarterback. And how do you think Jalen would handle a situation like that? What would be different between that and um, Tua Tagovailoa? What, what would be different? Like, the, the, he's not a, you know, um, there is a narrative that, okay, <laughs> because people try to justify. Because I don't know what it is in Philadelphia. We have to choose one side or the other. We can't just be pro Eagles. We have to choose Nick or Carson, Carson or Jalen. We like to put ourselves on one side, Republican, Democrat. We we can't we can't think in two dimensions, right? We can't think in, on, on two levels and say, hey, what's best for the team? And um, so I think that I think Jalen was was um, the starter at Alabama. He lost it to Tua. He stayed to try to win his starting position. He realized that he couldn't, and that's therefore he transferred, right? Because he wanted that opportunity to play in the NFL. But he didn't run from competition. He got beat out by competition. It's okay. You get beat sometime, and he had an opportunity to go somewhere else. In the NFL, you can't do that. Um, so he's not running from it. So if they bring someone in, I think that he'll thrive on it. I think that he won't He won't change his character at all. Um, but my question is, is, is uh, I don't necessarily think that – my question would be why. Right. That would, that was, that's what my question would be. OK, do you think that, you know, one of the quarterbacks that you get at six is going to be better? And, and, and then you draft the quarterback last year in the second round, you draft one in the first round. There are so many different needs. I didn't necessarily agree with the pick last year in the second round. There's so many needs that the Eagles have. We haven't had a, a Pro Bowl linebacker since when? 
right? We haven't had, you know, a, a, a lockdown corner. Now, Darius Slay is going to be, uh, be a great guy, but if you got Patrick Sertain Jr. there, like, I'm taking Patrick Sertain Jr. because he has the least likely chance. He has, he has the, the most upside, and he's mo the most guaranteed pick out of whoever's in the top 10, right? That's just, that's just me. I'm going to take Patrick Sertain Jr., and then I'll deal with everything else. But that's, that's just me and my, my, my two cents. <laughs> so you would take him over some of those receivers? 100%. Just because receivers, receivers, well, you, you got one receiver who hadn't played in a year. You got another receiver that's 165, 170 pounds soaking wet. You got a bunch of receivers that are 160 pounds, 170 pounds soaking wet, right? So how many receivers that are with that body type do you want and do you need, right? So those are the things, and, and none of them are like extremely big. You have a bunch of small guys that run really fast. Quez Rock, Watkins, a 4-3. Jalen Rager, a 4-3. John Hightower, close to a 4-3. You have a bunch of speed. You got a bunch of guys that can run fast. So I would rather put my eggs on a corner to be able to play bump man, and now you can put him on number one or number two, and you have uh, you know, a, a, a dual threat out there at cornerback, which gives the, 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 the pass rush a little bit more time. So that's what I would do. You make a good point. And, and to wrap this up, uh, after seeing Jalen Hurts, do you believe he can be a starting quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles for a number of years? Um, I do. I do. I, you know why? Because Jalen has a um, he's he has spatial awareness. Right. And he has and he has the ability when he looks at the field, he sees the rotation. Right. Some guys, they see the picture. Jalen sees the rotation. And, um, you know, and once he learns everything about this game, as far as, you know, consistently knowing who the mic is, knowing where he's hot, um, knowing, you know, the, the protections of this game. He sees the back end extremely well. Like I can show you plays where he sees it and was able to air it out. And I've been around a bunch of quarterbacks that can't see the, the, the rotation fast and in the moment. And he can. And it's very special to see. Um, there's plays this year where you where you have Carson or other guys around the league that they get in the two shell defense and he's on the wrong side of the field. He's on the side where it should be um, a single a single safety middle look. And, you know, it's very, very hard to do consistently. And I think that he sees that part of the game very easily. And um, the rest of it is just repetition. Well, you got great insight. Let, let me ask you one other thing before I let you go, because, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to wrap my head around, because I, I like Carson and, and man, he showed so much promise and, and, and expectations were there. Um, I, I wonder, you know, did he just not want to compete? And is it, is it fair to ask him to compete after giving him that contract? I mean, do you think that, it is a negative that he basically said he would rather go somewhere else now, or do you think the situation was tough for him in a bad situation? Um, it's a little bit of both, right? So let me give you a rundown. I give you a rundown, right? So I give a rundown. 2016, Carson's drafted. He plays okay, 16, 15. You know, he plays okay, but we said, okay, we give him a doubt. Actually, it was a little bit below average, average to below average, right? Didn't make the playoffs. He goes on, you know, after that season wins the Super Bowl, right? So he was he was with the team and, and doing well, MVP type season. Nick Foles, you know, finished the season, but he gets injured. 2018 started off a little spud, you know, Nick Foles starts the season. He's doing okay, but the team's not in position to make the playoffs. And this is where it changes for me. This is 2018 is where the mindset of Carson to me with the organization change. Here's why. They were not going to the playoffs. Carson was dealing with the back issue and he was playing through injury. Carson wanted to play. The organization chose against Carson's wishes to play Nick Foles. Nick Foles revives the season and goes on to the second round of the playoffs beating Chicago and barely losing to the Saints after, after a Alshon, um, Alshon Jeffrey drop. Now, why would you sit your guy that you're going to pay $100 million to and you sit him for a backup in that moment? Because the season wasn't going right. So there, right then, should have let the fans know and all of us know that there was some, some um, indecision on organization's part. 
And so 2018 happens, 2019 starts off really, really slow, gets really, really hot though at the end and brings them and, and takes them to the playoffs, winning the last four, four games and takes the playoffs, gets hurt again. So now out of those seasons, right? Three out of four seasons, Carson did not finish the season. 2020 happens. He plays historically bad. He gets benched, did not finish the season. So at, from an organization standpoint, you're saying I have this guy that's not going in the right direction. He's coming down from the Super Bowl. He hadn't played really well. His stats have gotten progressively worse over the last three years, and he's only finished four out of five seasons. So when you're looking at it from an organization's perspective, you're going to say that we either going to stick this out for a long haul or we need to make a change because he's not trending in the right direction and we can't depend on him to be healthy. And that's what they were saying when they drafted Jalen Hurts. So do I think that Carson Wentz can play? Do I think that he can get back there? Maybe Frank Wright has the juice and has the ability to wane him in as far as his technique because there's things that I saw from Carson that I didn't see in his first couple of years. Now that could be Frank Wright. And if he does well, all the best because he's a great person. He's a good teammate. He's a good dude. You want him to do well, but just because a guy can play well for one coach and he can't for the other, as the Philadelphia Eagles, you can't depend on that because you don't have Frank Wright. Yeah, you're right. And that's very interesting because I agree with you about 2018 with Nick Foles, but it's interesting because after we saw Nick Foles run the offense better that year than Carson, really, they gave Carson the extension and allowed Nick Foles to walk. Exactly. And there was a bunch of indecision there. So you see that from from and this is what this is what I think. And I don't know this. I think that the coaching staff wanted to move with Nick Foles. And I think that the organization wanted to move with Carson. And you saw that and all of that's a combination of what's happening, I believe, with Doug. I don't know. But that's what it looks like when I go back and I check the receipts of all the things that has transpired over the years. That's what it's looking like for me. And to get to answer your question a, a, a little bit further is that I don't think that anybody in the National Football League should be entitled to anything. It's just not the nature of this game. Right. You have a bunch of guys in this country and this is from a holistic standpoint, John. There's a bunch of Americans in this country that are between, you know, six foot and six four, and, you know, from 200 pounds to, you know, 230. We have a big crop to pull from. Therefore, if Jamal Charles get hurt, another guy steps in. If, you know, Drew Blesso gets hurt, Tom Brady steps in. If, you know, Le'Veon Bell's not playing, James Conner steps in. That's the nature of this game. So it's so competitive for every position, for some reason, except for the quarterback. And I'm gonna tell you why it's not, it's not competitive. It's because they're not teaching kids to play the game the right way in college. They're not teaching them how to read. They teach them how to scan. They win off athleticism. So therefore learning the game mentally, they're behind schedule. Therefore, Roethlisberger, Phillips Rivers, Drew Brees, Tom Brady, that generation can play forever because they're not being challenged because they learned the game the right way years ago and they didn't pimp the kids for the talent. So um, ultimately, everyone should be able to compete. Everyone should be able to compete. There should be no entitlement. And in a perfect world, in the National Football League, you should have to win your job each season. But Carson didn't want to do that. I don't necessarily know if it was Carson. Sometimes you can you can you can feel so much disrespect from the organization. He said, I may want to go. And maybe he said in, instead of competing, maybe it wasn't about competing. Maybe it was about being with the guy that he had the most respect for. There's some players that may say, you know, and some people that they can't work for you unless they respect you. And maybe that's the, the scenario or the case. There's reports of it out there. We don't know, but maybe he's saying, okay, I have my, like, I'll give him, I'll give an example. I didn't want to go to Carolina at the end of my career. I did not want to go. They offered me way more money. So I ended up going there because I knew I only had a couple of seasons left, but I didn't respect the way the Carolina Panthers play football and or their organization or any other thing like that. All I wanted to do was go and be with coach Reed because I knew 
that we had a chance to win if I went there. And maybe that's Carson in his mind. It had nothing to do with competition, it had to do with the person that's behind him. I, I agree with you. I think it became a thing for Carson about belief and tr trust and respect with the organization and the people in charge. I do, I do agree with that. You never, you never know. You never know how it goes. I know that the, that the coaches are doing great. Um, I know that they have, you know, a lot of guys that I know that, that they have a Eagles history in there. They have a very um, strong Eagles history in their, in their front office and their coaching staff. So, Well, I mean, I, I think it's like an onion. There's so many different layers to this and it, it's sad that it came to this, yeah. um, but we really appreciate the insight because, because I think, you know, and you've been there Um and, you know, and it's just a shame that it had to end like this. Yeah, you, you like I said, Carson's a good player. And I think that he can, I think he can um, revitalize his career, right? I think he can change it around. Um, I think there has to be some, you know, a, a quarterback's coach, an offense coordinator, and, you know, someone in his, in his ear to, to, um, to make sure that he's staying focused on the small things. And, you know, so, because, because, because Carson is a very, very strong-minded person. And I think that, I think ultimately it's going to take someone that he respects in order to do that. And do you think some of those things did go by the wayside mechanics technique because he, he kind of had his thought about what he wanted to do and he maybe didn't get hard coaching? Well, I thought, I thought that he got hard coaching. I just think that there are so many different nuances to this league. Like you have to watch, like, uh, it's almost like a parent, right? That when you have a kid, you know, and he's talented, you can't take him to everybody. You can't take him to a guru over here. You can't take him to this. You never know who's teaching the guys in the off season. Like I see some of the receivers and some of the footwork king and all. I'm like, that's some trash if I've ever seen it in my life. And they come back with it. All you have to do this. I'm like that. No, you don't. It's dumb. It's stupid. It's wasted motion. But this guy's making money off of you and everybody's going to him. And you think it's, you know, successful. It isn't. It's, it's inefficient. It's, and it's not productive. So you never know if that was a part of it because guys go to different guys off season. I know Carson's got his guys, but you want to kind of, keep guys tight and I think that Frank Wright having the history that he's had with Philip Rivers and having the history that he has with Carson winning the Super Bowl and having Philip again like um there there there's a lot of guys that um that that um that he's had and I think that he can that he can help Carson do you think that Doug found it difficult to get through to Carson with a lot of those things or to coach him hard in that way um all I know is that there is all I know I would say is that there is things that that Carson did that wasn't a part of, of Doug's coaching. Like there was just things that he would do that just wasn't a part of it. Like there's funny, awkward body throws that Carson made for no apparent reason. And if you look at the tape, the tape just backs that up. And I don't necessarily know where that came from. Like I, the only thing I can think of is that that had to be something that he was training on doing in the offseason. Right. So there is there are certain times and, in, 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 you know, where it wasn't something that he was being taught on the field, but you just never know. And, and maybe, and, and as a player, sometimes you think, sometimes you got to overcome coaching. Like, let's be honest, no matter what player it is, you have to overcome coaching. And I felt like um, that sometimes Carson, you know, did his own thing. And it's, it's okay. He, he thought that, you know, I, I, I've been guilty of it. You know, my, mine just worked, you know, so, but <laughs> it happens to every coach and every player. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we really appreciate it because I think Philly is trying to understand exactly what happened here. And I think you've got very good insight and perspective with that. I, this interview probably won't, you know, no, I, I don't know the the, the details of, of the front office and Doug and Carson and how everything transpired. You, you don't know. Like, it's going to be hard to understand unless Carson comes out with a comes, you know, I would love to see that. I would read that, you know, tell all Eagles, you know, hit, um, you know, career book type of thing. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Well, maybe one day long down the road, everybody can get back together and discuss kind of like Andy Reid and T.O. kind of, you know, you can tell they've worked through their things. Yeah, they work through and but you can you can clearly see that T.O. is, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, a narcissist at that moment in time. You know, I'm not saying that he is, but that, in that yeah. moment, it was very, very hard, you know, so um, it's different here. We know that Doug is a good person. We know that Carson's a good person. So you start to look at it. It's like, how did these two not get along? And it just doesn't make sense to us. Like in the T.O. Andy thing, you can kind of see 
where the problem lie. And here you can't necessarily see how it could get to this place and therefore it's challenging for all of us. It's a great point. Um, well, we appreciate the time. We appreciate all your insights, Jason. And uh, it sounds to me, you do have a lot of coaching in you, but also a little general manager in you too. So maybe we'll see down the road what happens with you. Uh, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> thanks a lot. All right. Thanks a lot, John. Appreciate you, man. That was great. Oh. A lot of great. Oh, launch is opening again, baby. When? <laughs> when? Launch is opening um, on the 26th, so Friday. Yep. So, so we're call. reopening after, after a year. Launch trampoline park. Yeah, Wait. after a year. And, Wait, are you going to call it relaunch? Yeah, relaunch. We need to, right? <laughs> good after stuff. After a year, finally open. You, that's good for you. Congrats. I uh, appreciate that.